Okay, so we're very creative with our naming. Webinar number number 11, our weekly update. So here are the disclosures, mainly just you know some of the investment disclosures because we'll be going through just some updates on what's going on with the markets. Um, you know, this is um, a lot of good content from Raymond James, but what we're going to talk about today is my opinion, uh, opinion of Vance Wealth. And um, you know, one of the most important things is if you hear something that makes sense and you want to get some one-on-one -on -one advice, uh, please reach out to us. It's hard to do this in a mass format in terms of giving any specific advice. So this is really designed to be educational and hopefully valuable. Okay, so our agenda for today, uh, just a quick update on COVID-19. I know the data is changing rapidly. Um, so I'm gonna give an update on what's going on. Uh, talk about the road to economic recovery, what's really happening there. Uh, the, ind uh, the airline industry, we're gonna just do a, a quick update on there on some of the, uh, what's, what was coming out of Raymond James from our analysts in terms of what's gonna likely uh, unfold with the airline industry. Uh, I do have some slides on the 2020 election and yes, it's kind of crazy. The election uh, is upon us. I think we're around 160 days out. So we're less than six months out. Uh, so, um, you know, if you guys were all tired of the COVID-19 media coverage, well, get ready for all the election coverage, which is probably worse to watch. So unfortunately, well, fortunately, I haven't been watching a lot of TV. Hopefully many of you have stopped watching TV. We've been watching a fair amount of shows and movies, but trying to stay away from a lot of the, a lot of the, the mainstream media and just media in general. It's too noisy, a little bit too depressing. So I prefer to read the journal and read the times and just read different sources. And so hopefully you guys are finding good escape. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the election. Then we'll talk a little bit about just some investing. Um, there's concept growth versus value. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on there. And that's kind of it. So let's move on. So, all right. So one of the things that we all know is that the states are starting to reopen. Counties are starting to reopen. Uh, and, you know, everywhere around the country is different. Um, and if you, um, if you think about, well, Trump actually put together some criteria for basically how to reopen. And uh, if you look at the chart on the left-hand side, this actually shows you uh, all the different states and it shows you the states that are meeting the criteria. So I think it's something like um, maybe seven or eight are actually meeting all three criteria, which is gonna allow them to open up faster. I think we have only three or four states that are only meeting one criteria and then with the majority in the meet, meet the two criteria. So one of the things is that we're, we know that this is starting to happen. We're starting to get, and we see this here in California, we're starting to see you know, different counties have a different approach. Um, but one of the biggest thing that's gonna be interesting is you know, what can we potentially have like a second wave, a second wave of, of illness, infection, and, and a respike. So I think the next slide, I'm gonna go through that. Uh, but one of the things that's been happening, so this chart on the right is showing the states that are easing restrictions, and it shows the number of states on, uh, number of states on this side, obviously 50 being uh, all 50 states. And then it shows kind of different areas of what's getting back. So look at where we are today. Um, well, this was, a, I guess, we're about a week old now on this date, but um, yeah, about a week old. And so you can see kind of the, the stay at home, the food and drink, um, and you can see this is now all of these are about 30 states and uh, 30 states and above. Uh, then this top one is outdoor recreation. So I think I don't think it's all, but maybe 48 states that have really eased restrictions for outdoor and recreation. So this is obviously a good sign. Uh, this is what I think a lot of people are calling for, so that we can get back to work and get things functioning again. Um, so, but again, this is where you know there could be uh, some risk here for uh, for the economy. You know, depending on how things uh, how we go back if we're not distancing properly and if we're putting ourselves in, in harm's way. So one of the things that we look at a lot of this heavy data, and I apologize, I know there's a lot of data when it comes to this, but one of the thing that we are seeing is new cases in the US are trending down. So if you look on the left-hand side, it shows US uh, new cases, and you can see these little, uh, it's like dotted uh, gold lines, and the trend is heading down. The trend is heading down on a path where it would suggest that June 25th to July 10th is kind of this uh, period of time where we're not going to go to zero, but where we get to a really low number. And so that's at least the pace that we're on, which is a great thing. You know, we did our job here. Um, and 
Um, you know, when you start looking at where we're heading, that looks great and everything, but look on the right hand side. So, and I think this is what gets people a little bit nervous. You look at some states like Georgia, South Carolina, Florida is a good example of this, where you can see Florida, they have their dotted line kind of in the middle here. Oh, let me get my pointer. Um, they have this dotted line running right down the middle, and this is when the stay at home orders uh, expired. And then if you look, that's when a bunch of cases were dropping off. But look at what's happened. We've seen a little bit of a spike. So, you know, as we have more engagement with people, as people are, are coming back together in the, work, in the workplace or gathering, social gatherings, we're definitely going to see a spike here. So the question becomes, can we keep this under control? Because I think the one thing that we all are, all are fearful of is if this spikes, do we go into another shutdown, which would be highly disruptive for our economy? Uh, because I think the best case scenario is that we make incremental changes, inc incremental improvements where we get to the point where, okay, we start getting back to some normalcy. And again, that's starting, I think in California, a little bit later than everywhere else, but it's also because we have, we're more at risk here. So, you know, this is where, the, this is where we're trending. One of the reasons why we're doing these so often is these, these, uh, these data points are changing and changing rapidly. And so again, the, the news is good, uh, but we're not out of the woods. We still have, you know, we still have a lot ahead of us and, you know, most healthcare professionals and, and experts are, you know, predicting this is going to be with us for, you know, at least a year, um, hopefully to a lesser degree, but uh, for at least a year. So we have to be prepared for that. Um, one of the things that I think is getting the stock market excited, uh, or at least excited for periods of time, is the fact that I think there's over like 100 companies, projects worldwide that are focusing on developing some sort of vaccine or therapeutic to deal with this. And so, We've seen a lot of these companies and by be putting these companies up here, this is not a recommendation to buy these. It's mainly just to kind of give you an update on what we're seeing. And you can see it was the Gilead's uh, Remdesivir, their product and then Regeneron were the two big ones that were, were really looking at had a more, uh, more progress maybe than anything else. And so, you know, what you're all, you are seeing in this space is these stocks have been really volatile and a lot of them heading up because of the promise of, you know, some sort of therapeutic, the promise of some sort of vaccine. But then you can see all these big companies like J&J, &J, Pfizer, and they're where they are. They're all still really early. So even a lot of the optimism, which I know a lot of people are starting to feel, you know, they're still saying that these vaccines, some of this is, is still, we're looking at January of next year. So we still have a lot of time, uh, but that's going to allow us to have more confidence. And so we're, de we're seeing progress. We are, we're also going to see fits and starts, meaning we're going to look like we're making progress and then it's like, hold on, we don't have enough information because that's one of the biggest challenges is that we don't have a ton of information with these trials. They're not long enough and there's not enough people, but I think we're kind of clinging to how do we get some good news? And so the beauty of our system, the beauty of capitalism, the beauty of the profit motive is that these companies are are out there to find um, the vaccine or cure because they then can be that one company or two or second company, let's say, to market that can actually sell and, and create a product that we need as, as, as consumers. And so that's the beauty of our system is that we will find a cure, we'll find a vaccine. Um, it's just a matter of time at this point. So there's some good news out there, um, but you know, it's gonna, it, it's gonna take, take a little time to manifest itself. So for those of you who have been joining me on a bi-weekly or weekly basis, Raymond James, I thought, really nailed this in terms of putting together what they call this K-style recovery. So for those of you that are new, I'll, I'll just kind of go over it again. But if you think about when the economy goes down into a recession and recovers, you kind of have a few options, right? You can have a V recovery, which means you have a pretty sharp bounce back, which obviously would be the most desired, right? Because we bounce back pretty quickly. Then you could have more of like a, uh, like a U-shaped recovery, which means the bottom forms just takes longer to get out. Or you have an L-shaped recovery, which means you have a sharp drop, but a really slow recovery on the way back. And so Raymond James analysts um, put together this concept of a K-recovery. And so the K-recovery basically shows us there's, there's basically four paths. We have the industries that essentially had no, uh, no drop off. And in fact, sales are amazing. So, and then, and then we saw uh, industries where we went straight down and basically stopped or ceased to exist. And then you had those that are starting to bounce back, those that are in recovery mode and those that may, maybe are dipping back down and are gonna take a little bit longer. So that's what this K style recovery is that the economy is not one size fits all. It's actually gonna be hitting these different sectors differently. And you're seeing that in the stock market as well, but let's just look at a few charts. So 
what I have here in the top left corner, this represents the, the group that has really thrived in this environment and that's e-commerce. So e-commerce sales is up 14% over the last two months. And that's actually the largest increase on a two month basis that we've, we've actually seen. And so think about that L during the slowdown that e-commerce sales has been is the largest growth that we've seen basically on record, which is pretty remarkable. And we know that's happening because we're being forced to shop from home, buy our groceries from home, do a lot of things through e-commerce. And the good news for us is we do have the infrastructure in place, even though I know a lot of places now you're seeing that they're sold out of stuff. So, um, then we're looking at this bottom left-hand quarter. This is clothing and clothing accessories. Purchases were, were down 80% in April. So this, uh, this is one of those industries where basically people stop spending and we just saw this you know, fall off the cliff. And unfortunately, this is gonna be one of these areas that's gonna be hard hurt um, and may not recover. That's the category Raymond James kind of putting the, this retail space in is a, the in not recovering space. And unfortunately, a lot of this um, can be local boutiques and a lot of small businesses around the country. And unfortunately, they're going to, they're really uh, suffering and feeling the pain. And that's unfortunately not going away anytime soon. If we looked up here in the top right, home maintenance spending. So home projects are increasing. So look what's going on here. We're seeing since this, you know, started coming out of the gate, you know, uh, looking at uh, April, the data a month ago, you're seeing a massive increase in, in home maintenance spending to the point of where, you know, places like Home Depot and others are running out of paint, they're selling out of stuff, selling out of supplies, because there's a lot of demand. People are at home and they want to spend money because number one, to fill time. Number two, they're realizing there's some things they want to do around their house. And then this bottom right is airline transportation expenditures declined over 50% in March. And so, Pretty remarkable, right? It looks like April is going to be even worse. So if we're looking at that, um, and this is really that sector that you know is is taking a, a hard, it's really taking a beating, and it'll start to make its way out of it. But we're still a long way from seeing the airline space really improve. And so um, I'll go into that on this slide. So this came from uh, um, the Ray uh, Raymond James uh, uh, airline industry analyst. And there's a lot of words on this page. So I, sometimes I, I don't know what's best to show you. A slide full of lots of words or charts with graphs. Because the words, it's too much to read. The charts or graphs is, is, can be complicated and too much data. So I'm going to give it a go here. So a couple of things that, you know, were, that this is a staggering uh, bullet point here, the second one down. That basically as of May 15th, TSA passenger uh, throughput uh, was down 91% year over year but it was up from a low of 96% seen in mid-April. So it's getting a little bit better as of May, but I mean, come on, down 91 versus down 96 is not really a, an improvement. I guess it's heading in the right direction, but you know, just think of that. I mean, that's, that's insane to see that level of traffic, which or that the lack of traffic, I should say. Um, so, you know, the flying experience, what's that going to look like? You know, are we going to have the confidence to fly or is it going to be more of a hassle? you know, requiring masks, requiring temperature checks, right? That's going to help with confidence, but it also is going to change the whole experience, right? So how the airline industry comes out of this, it's going to be pretty interesting. So, um, you know, the one thing that we know is going to start to happen is that basically the, the recovery in what they call uh, VFR, visiting family and relatives, like that's going to improve, right? Because people want to get out there and see their family. And maybe leisure travel, right? Where people are like, I got to get out of the house and go have some fun. But, you know, corporate travel is probably going to take a lot longer, right? Corporate travel, most companies, a lot of companies have suspended corporate travel. And a big part of that is liability concerns, right? They don't want to put their employees in harm's way. And so there, uh, most companies, have, uh, many have suspended travel through the end of the year using Zoom, this kind of functionality to actually do business. Now, we know that's not a solution forever, but it is for now. And so that's going to take, and, and a corporate traveler, a lot of times are paying, uh, you know, more, they're, they're buying more expensive tickets late, you know, they're non, they're not, you know, they're doing like refundable tickets, they're doing first class business class. So that's definitely going to take a hit on the airline industry and still be a headwind on the airline industry recovery. Uh, so um, we still have low fares, but, you know, as, you know, as the supply declines and demand increases, the fares are going to rebound. So, I mean, I guess the long and short with the airline industry is a lot of our companies have a fair amount of cash. Uh, so the airline industry got uh, healthy over these last 10 years, you know, they changed their model. And so they were in a pretty good position coming into this. Um, 
So I know p there's some value investors that are out there looking for things like this. You know, my taste is uh, maybe a, a little bit too early, but again, we don't really focus on individual companies. So, you know, just kind of the take the U US airline industry came into this strong, um, we'll make it out of this, but it's still going to be tough. You know, there's all that conversation about what's going to happen with a middle seat. Are they going to get rid of it? Just going to change the whole experience. <clears throat> all right. So given that I, I am allowing for, and when I say allowing for, um, I allow, oh, I'm going to have some Q and a, it's a little dangerous in this setting to have some election updates. So don't shoot the messenger and frankly, you know, how good is the data really? So it's a little bit of a guess. So I'm adding this in here as a little bit of fun. Now I know the election conversation is not fun. We're, we're actually a, a very divided uh, nation right now in terms of uh, looking at the parties. So I'm not trying to make fun of that, but I mean, just a little bit of fun in terms of just what's, what are the, what are the uh, polls saying? What are some, what's some of the data that's out there just to give you guys some perspective of what's happening. So this is some data that came from wall street journal. That was just in a, a recent poll. And so on the left-hand side, it shows that Biden is preferred to handle the uh, coronavirus response. And then if you look on the right-hand side, this was the, um, the, the, the polling that said Trump is preferred to handle the economy. So um, you can see um, that it's you know, almost basically a mirror image of itself in terms of what it looks like. Um, in term, so the one thing is, and I don't think that's a surprise. I mean, I think that generally, whether this is right or wrong, there's this idea that Republicans handle the economy better and Democrats handle social issues better, right? So I think that's how this is kind of coming out. And it's, it looks like this poll pretty much voted right down that line. Again, whether it's right or wrong, that's just what, what is polling. So just wanted to give you my thoughts on that. And then this is a noisy one, but the one thing that, you know, we know this election is going to be dictated by swing states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, Florida, Wisconsin, Arizona. Those are the big swing states. And if you look at national average of, un of unemployment right now is around 20%. And two of the biggest swing states, Michigan and Pennsylvania, are getting hit really hard. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why actually right now uh, Biden's polling better, uh, but it's because of these swing states. Um, as we start getting into it, I found this one to be fascinating. Now, trends are kind of uh, meant to be broken, but let me kind of explain what this is. So what we're looking at here is this concept of when you're an outsider or you're an insider, right? So an outsider would be a fresh face and an insider would be a, uh, for lack of a better term, maybe a career politician. And so if you look here in the post Vietnam era, Outsider Democratic nominees have tended to win the White House while establishment candidates lose. And so if you look over here, like look at the list, and this goes back again, post-World, uh, post-Vietnam, excuse me, and you can see Carter was an outsider, he won. And then Mondale and Dukakis, they were insiders, they lost. Then Clinton was a fresh face, outsider, he won. Gore and Kerry, insiders, they lost. Obama, uh, outsider, win. Uh, Hillary Clinton was an insider and lost. And so Biden clearly is an insider. Um, he's got 40 years of experience in Washington. So this obviously shows this is not a, this is not a trend in his favor. So the question is, is he going to break it or is it going to continue? And at this stage, we just don't know. And kind of the conclusion of the analysts out of, out of Raymond James. And again, I mean, everyone got the Trump uh, presidency or the Trump win wrong as well. When I say everyone, um, many of the uh, I should say most of the, uh, I guess the talking heads in the media and even a lot of analysts. Uh, right now, they're kind of viewing this as a toss up. Now we're six months out. It's probably just kind of a fair talking point to have to look at this as a toss up. Uh, but a couple things that I just want to go through. So the next six months, obviously really hard to predict because of what's happening with the coronavirus or with COVID-19. If we come out of this strong, that's obviously going to bode well for Trump. If we, if we struggle and it gets worse, that's not going to bode well for Trump. That means that that's going to probably give Biden the lead. But I guess right now, if the, if the election were held today, polling does give Biden the edge. Um, so what we don't know is what the, what the employment trends are going to look like, what's going to happen with the stock market, what's going to happen with a lot of these issues. Virus fears may impact vo uh, uh, voting behavior, right? So, you know, what's going to happen with turnout? Um, that's, a big, that's a big concern. And then the, 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 the talking point we're going to have right now, or I should say over the next several months, is going to be, who is Biden's running mate going to be? You know, are you going to have somebody that tends to lean more on the left and, you know, really goes after the Bernie fans or more of a moderate? 
which is going to be designed to go after those more moderate Republicans or the swing voters. Um, there's a lot, there's a big, I guess conventional wisdom is saying that Biden will likely pick a female running mate. So, but we will see. So lots is coming up. I tell you just with full disclosure, I got this totally wrong two years ago. So for what it's worth, uh, take that as a grain of salt. I'm just kind of reporting some of the, the data that I'm seeing. Um, and then these were some of the surveys with just actually that came out of Raymond James clients that kind of talked about, you know, what are the likely scenarios and the, the one that had the highest probability of occurring, doesn't mean right or wrong, was Trump winning um, the White House, but with the Democrats controlling the, the Senate, or excuse me, the, and the Republicans controlling the Senate and the Democrats controlling the House. And so uh, kind of split government, which is one of the things I think that we tend to favor. Um, but you just don't know, because it comes down to those swing states, um, they're just, there's too much up in the air right now. Uh, and, you know, I do think our, our political dynamic is going to be, or I should say our media dynamic is going to shift in a major way. Probably once Biden announces his running mate and, you know, if we get go through the convention process. So it's going to be fairly interesting. I don't really love the political dynamic, but you know what, we're going to be in the middle of it. And so we just got to take it for what it is. So um, I thought this was kind of interesting. So, you know, what if, what if COVID-19 is still there, still very present on election day? You know, what does that look like? Um, I've been doing mail-in voting forever just because it's convenient. Um, but, you know, is that going to be a reality? Is that going to hurt um, one party over the other? Um, you know, different states. I think the state of Washington is always um, mail-in ballots, right? So, you know, by doing mail-in, they might have, you know, longer time counting, maybe delayed the announcement date. So there's going to be a lot of challenges when it comes to this. And, and also, they're going to probably have to expand the voting window, right? Because if COVID is an issue, you know, having everyone come on the same day and long lines, it's just not going to work. And so we're probably going to have a change in the way um, that our elections are, are, are being managed and how we manage the election day. So stay tuned for that, because I know when you start getting into changing how things have been done, everybody gets upset because they feel like you're going to disenfranchise people and you're going to, people are going to get left out of the mix. And obviously, if you're fearful around it and you just don't want to go to the polls, um, you know, that, that's obviously not great for our, for our country, right? We want people to vote. And uh, so the bottom line, you can see on their fear and inconveniences. I feel like inconveniences is the biggest one. If people have to wait in long lines, hours and hours. It's going to discourage them from voting, which, again, is not a good thing. That may tend to favor um, Trump um, because he, his base is... Uh, seems to be a lot more excited than 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 Biden's base at this moment. So that's going to be that swing voter to see how things how things kind of play out. All right. So kind of transitioning from gave you a COVID update, gave you an update on some of the political uh, talking points that we're just starting now, and then I just want to dive into what's going on with the stock market. So one of the things that I think we all inherently know is there are certain industries that are thriving right now, right? And there's certain certain industries that are that are dying, that are really struggling. And the stock market is reflecting that to the T. So if you look at this chart on the left-hand side, so this on the, on the, this, this graph over here on the left shows that the basically S&P sector dispersion is widening, meaning sector dispersion, the, the difference between what one sector is doing versus the other. So the best, and this was as of May 14th, so it's changed a little bit, but the best part of the market year to date was technology up 1% with the worst industry being energy down 40. So think of that, that's a 41% difference in performance in five and a, uh, in, in not even five months. And so that's, pr that's very wide dispersion. It's the biggest dispersion we saw since 2002. And then when you start looking and breaking it down basically on an, end, uh, an industry level, the best performing is internet retail, which is you know the Amazons of the world, let's say, and the worst performer is airlines. So, and the spread is 87% because the internet retail is up over 20 and airlines are down over 60. So just think about that. It's, it's a remarkable thing. And if you, if you think about what's actually happening, internet retail, wireless, telecom, software, biotech, metals and mining, because gold's been doing okay, tech hardware. So, you know, that's this really small pocket of the, of the stock market that's been doing well. Um, I, I, right now, I believe it's something like over 400 companies out here. It's on this slide. So if you look at then the Dow, so the Dow industrial average is only 30 companies. 
Um, only five of the companies on the Dow are positive this year, primarily in tech and consumer. So Microsoft and Apple, Home Depot and, and, and uh, Walmart, and then you have J&J. So those are the only positive companies right now on the Dow. And then you can see the majority are negative. And then if you look at the S&P, Look at, the, look at some of the performance. I think the best performing is maybe up 50% where the worst performing down 80. And you can see, look at this, uh, 418 companies are negative year to date. Um, and the best performing stock is outperforming the worst performing stock is by 166%. So that's one of the reasons we've been talking to you and talking to clients about re-looking and revisiting active management. In an environment where you're gonna have winners and losers, Buying the broad market is probably not going to be the winning uh, recipe. Being more selective is likely going to be the winning recipe because there's going to be certain industries that are going to thrive and those that are not going to do well. Now, the thing we have to be careful about, and I don't know if this goes into, yeah. The thing we have to be careful about is the fact that, and I hear this from clients, oh, technology is great, healthcare is great, you know, communication is great. Those are all great se sectors and we don't disagree with that. The problem is, is those sectors are also very expensive, right? Because people are buying them and that their prices are up, their stock prices are up because there's more demand. People want to own those sectors because they're thriving. And then you have other as, as sectors that are way underperforming and are cheap because of the fact that people don't want to own them. So one of the things you have to be careful of is, yes, technology, healthcare, these areas are going to grow a lot faster than the rest of the market, the rest of the economy. But when you have valuations get, get that uneven, that doesn't mean these are gonna be the best investments. So it still makes sense to take a balanced approach because the favorite sectors are expensive but are probably gonna keep growing. The, the unloved sectors are cheap. So even if they just bounce a little bit, you can still have a decent return. So that's why we do favor a more balanced approach rather than just owning kind of what's popular. I think that's the dangerous thing that people are gonna do. I also feel, and I think you probably heard me say this before, I also feel like we're gonna get a fair amount, there's a fair amount of day trading going on right now. And the day traders tend to favor the high growth names. And why is there day trading? Well, there's no sports to bet on anymore and people have more free time. And so there's a lot more trading activity that are going on that you know, individual people who are not well-trained in this are just trading on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, some of, obviously it's to make money, but you know, some of it is also for, for the sport and the feeling of, of trading and, and, and gambling a little bit. And so we always like to, like to take more of this long-term approach and, and, and be much more focused on making good decisions over the long haul. Okay. We're doing okay on time. So this, um, this is kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly, and may, mainly it's the, uh, it's the ugly, but um, so the first quarter earnings were terrible as expected, but the second quarter is going to get worse. So if you look over here on the S and P 500 earnings, we're looking at the second quarter earnings likely going to drop by about 40%. So we saw about a 13% decline. We're, so the, the second quarter is going to be far worse. And then you can start seeing the recovery. So the one disconnect that I think everyone, most people are feeling is that the data is still getting worse. Why is the market going up? Well, the market's going up because it's anticipating the change. It's anticipating that things are going to get better in the future. And that's why people are investors. People invest for the future, not just for a one uh, for a year or for a short period of time. And so you definitely see we're going through the pain today and the recovery doesn't look like it's coming till 2021, but that's one of the things that investors are anticipating what that future is going to be. So, and there's been a fair amount of like surprises out there. Uh, and, you know, when you have markets that are beating or, um, you know, or sorry, companies that are surprising to the upside or surprising to the downside, uh, you know, they're, they're being rewarded and punished kind of equally. So just know second quarter earnings, which are going to be more in July, August time are likely going to get worse, but we do believe that the markets are, are factoring that in already. Um, okay. So there's idea of growth and value, right? So we've already talked a lot about the growth sectors are, the technology side and the healthcare and communication. And if you look at over the last 15 years, this shows that the total return between growth and value is that growth is outperformed by about 200% over this period of time, um, which is remarkable. So, because if, if you look back and you go back over the last 90 years, value has outperformed over that period of time. So growth has really had an amazing run. And this level of difference, uh, we, hadn't, we haven't seen this 
since back in 2000, right around the dot-com bubble bursting. So one of the things that we definitely warn clients and we make sure we maintain diversification as well. Yes, growth has done better. That doesn't mean this trend is going to follow indefinitely. Now, Raymond James, if you read up here, they believe that growth is going to continue to outperform. And so when we look at our portfolios for clients, we're making sure we maintain the balance. We're not all value. We're not all growth. We want to have a combination of both uh, because we think we'll do well. And look at what we have here just year to date. Value companies are down about 22% and growth are only down one. So as we look into the report, our portfolios and what you might be looking at yours is the growth names have done really well. The value names have not done well. Uh, but again, this, when I started in the business in 1997 and we were, we had a very similar dynamic to this where everyone just wanted growth, growth, growth. And that ended with the dot-com bubble bursting, which was all these great growth companies and things fell apart. We don't think that that's what we're on, but we just want to caution people to say, we only want growth. It's so important to have balance. We don't, we don't know when these things are going to come out of favor. And it's just really important to maintain discipline, maintain balance in accounts and not just uh, getting caught up and getting excited about growth only because um, I've seen how, overvaluation can can get companies into trouble, get investors into trouble, excuse me. So just maintain that approach. But you know, those are the things that everybody, I mean, I can go to anybody right now and say, we're going to load up on technology, healthcare, all my, every client would be like, great, do it. I have so much confidence in those. And then you start looking at, well, what, where else would you invest? Oh, I don't like real estate anymore because that market's going to change. You know, whenever everyone feels super confident on one side of things, um, you have to be careful there because the bal balancing a portfolio is where you have success over a long period of time and not just focusing on what's popular. So just be, be careful there because we're seeing a lot of that. Um, this is a little bit more of kind of the same. Uh, it's kind of, there's a lot of data here. I'm just going to jump over this one just for time, time perspective. So this gives you a little bit of sense. I do get the question a lot, like, well, you know, what does that mean growth versus value? So this is just shows you the top 10 companies on the, on the Russell 1000 growth versus the top uh, 10 companies on the Russell 1000 value. So if you look at the top companies here, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Alphabet, which is Google, you know, those are, these are all actually positive and you take the top 10 holdings and they're actually up 8% for the year. Then you go over to value, which is names you recognize, but just in different industries, you know, Berkshire Hathaway, which is Warren Buffett's company, you know, JP Morgan, Johnson & Johnson. Exxon, right? Going down the list, they're down 22%, right? So um, this gives you a, it shows you what's, what's been going on in these two different sectors. Um, and you, and you know, the, the, re the remarkable thing is that if you look at this, uh, the top 10 companies, it makes up 36% of the index. These 10 companies make up 36%, a third of the Russell 1000 growth uh, stocks. So just pretty fascinating to see that list. Again, maintaining balance, we think is really, really important. Um, then lastly, as we kind of wrap up, so you've seen this replay, this is kind of that summary again, on the left hand side shows really what are the positive catalysts that are going to drive returns higher. And the plus sign is the monetary policy by the Fed, the fiscal policy by the federal government, the stimulus packages that are coming in looks like we might be on the verge of another big one which I hopefully they'll slow it down and do it, do it a little bit more effectively. Uh, and then the development of a vaccine um, and then not no longer dominating the nightly news. I think we're going to switch from, like I said, COVID-19 to the election. Um, but those are the positive, the potential catalysts for positive returns. Most of this is baked into the system. These are, these two here are a little bit of an unknown in terms of the timing of when that's going to happen. But what we do expect is more volatility. We've seen this really amazing bounce. Going forward, it's going to be tougher because earnings numbers aren't going to be great uh, for a lot of industries. Um, unemployment issues are still going to manifest themselves. And so these are some of the catalysts that we see for future market volatility. You know, a second wave of more cases, uh, fa failure of some of these vac vaccines that people get excited about. Political risk is clearly one uh, that are making people nervous. And then geopolitical, right? We're still seeing the tensions between uh, us and China and the rest of the world. This is not going away. So even though we have this crisis going on, there's still these risks that are out there. And again, this is not a concern for the long-term health of, the, of our economy, but definitely in the near term and you know, presenting some, some real challenges for, for market volatility. All right, so what's next here? So we're wrapping up and then we'll do questions. So if you have questions, put them in. Let's see if I have any in the queue right now. I do, I just have one. So 
if you'd like to ask any questions, this is a good opportunity because I will be able to, uh, to answer them for you. So here's what we have next. So we're going to do in two weeks, webinar number 12. Um, one of the questions I've been getting a lot, and this just takes a lot more preparation on my end, which I'm happy, which I'm going to do for this next one, is will we have high inflation as a result of the stimulus? With all the printing of money, are we going to have inflation and is inflation going to be a problem? What will this mean for our national debt and future taxes? So that's been a big topic. And while I wish I had all the answers in a crystal ball, I don't, but I'm going to share with you some of the his historical facts and what my expectations for that reality. Uh, that will be in two weeks. And then webinar lucky number 13, uh, which will be June 23rd. I'm gonna share with some of my controversial and crazy ideas on how to fix the student loan crisis and, and how to repair the social security system. So I will get definitely give an update, but I'm gonna go in into the weeds a little bit on uh, social security and student loan issues. You know, I kind of feel like right now, hopefully we have, the, we're trying to rebuild and, and stabilize this economy. But then I think we, as a nation, need to fix some of our big structural issues that unfortunately I don't think either party really wants to tackle because it's so unpopular from a political perspective. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this, a little bit controversial, so it's just gonna be my opinion on it. I have some crazy ideas on that, so I'll share that with you on that webinar. And then starting in July, we're gonna to go to uh, monthly. So we're gonna host on a monthly basis. We're gonna target the third Tuesday on every month at 4.30, hopefully this works uh, well. So. That'll be July uh, 21st. And so we're going to do our best to, you know, obviously get this out. Tara does, you know, alerts you guys through email uh, and through social media. So uh, hopefully today was valuable. And now we're going to jump into some questions and let's just see what we have for today. So let's see. Um, it says, hi, John. Can you please explain in a bit more detail what Vance is doing regarding reallocating portfolios? Okay. So... That's a really good question. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. So one thing just to caveat that is, you know, asset allocation is very particular to each person, right? So it's hard to give a, a kind of a generic term, but I will share with you what we have been doing. And this has been occurring over the last, um, over the last two months, pretty much across the board for clients. So what the, the biggest change, the, the first change that we did is we reallocated, which meant our stock allocation had declined so, um, so much because of the sell-off that our mixture was out of alignment. So let's just say you have a typical growth portfolio and you have 80% in, in the stock market and 20% in fixed. Because of the sell-off, that 80% became 20, uh, 75 and the fix grew to 25. So part of our rebalancing process is to get it back to that 80-20. So that's number one is we wanna make sure the risk and the growth assets are equally balanced um, based on you, our clients' objectives their, uh, and their risk tolerance. So that's number one. So that's something that's happening ongoing. When we have volatility, it's a little bit more pro uh, pronounced and we're actually, um, but that's something we do all the time. What, what, the changes that we're, we're making that are different now than they have in the last, let's say five or six years, is that we've been going in and replacing some of our more indexed or passive investments um, things that are just tracking the market. Um, and we're focusing more on active management where managers, instead of owning, um, you know, let's say thousands of holdings um, are going to be owning 40 holdings, 50 holdings, 60 holdings. Now we still have broad based portfolios, but we're adding more active solutions in there because we think that over this next five to 10 years, that because of the discrepancies of, of companies, that uh, good active managers are gonna add value there. So that's one of the things we're definitely encouraging. We're trying to look at clients who have 401ks that are not with us, that we need to look at reallocating. But all of these things we're looking at to make sure that you know, our portfolios are positioned for this next decade ahead. And while I think a lot of people are really focused on what's going on today, which, is, which we need to be, we're focusing down the road, what's this next 10 years gonna look like and how do we make good decisions today that are gonna position our clients and reward them accordingly, right? So um, obviously we don't have a crystal ball, but it's our job to be making these decisions. And so that's been a big part of these changes is, is making that adjustment to where we think uh, the returns are gonna go. And it does mean from a reallocating per, uh, perspective, we are maintaining balance between value companies and growth companies, but we're really searching for managers that have been able to add value. When I say value, uh, I'm looking at a good performance. Um, let's see here. So. 
I got another question. Could you say something about what the impact on the economy uh, would it be if Trump wins and Biden wins? Oh, that's like the probably the hardest question I can answer. It's fraught with um, political challenges. And so, um, you know, whether you are left leaning, right leaning or more moderate, um, you know, one of the things that I have 100% confidence in is as an American system, we thrive, you know, our entrepreneurial spirit, how we function, um, we truly have a system built to, to help us thrive and continue to grow as a nation. And so um, if you look at the history going back, let's just say the last 50 years going through, you know, presidencies like Reagan or Clinton or Bush or Obama, and you look at where the best performance has been from a stock market perspective, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag, and, but actually even leaning more towards the Democrats. So in terms of just the stock market performance, that's not always the economic performance, but, and, and a lot of that is because the 90s were really strong. And then during the Obama administration, he basically started office right at the end of the financial crisis. And so the recovery was really, was really widespread. And so um, the more difficult question to answer, and so I can look back and tell you which, which presidency the markets have done the best, which, and, the, and technically, if you look back, at the, you know, going back 50 years, the best scenario for stock market performance, again, this is stock market performance only, I'm not measuring anything else, has been a Democrat president with a Republican controlled House and Senate. So that was very apparent during the late 90s during Clinton. Um, and so that was that was the single best performing stock market time. Now, we could debate what, what you know, who drove that was it the was it the uh, was it the president or was it the, uh, was it the Congress? And that's a much more difficult question to, to answer and one that we're probably never gonna have consensus on. Uh, but if you look at that period of time, that's the case. But more broadly, you know, from, a, from an economic perspective, the economy has tended to function better in a lower tax, lower regulation uh, environment. Um, so, but you know, the stock market doesn't necessarily always translate during that period of time. And so it's really hard for me. I, it, it almost, and you could probably see me just, I don't want to say getting uncomfortable, but it's hard to kind of say what's better or worse, because frankly, I think we'll thrive no matter who's in office. Um, everyone's interests are a little bit different. And so um, we all know what we champion, what we, what we truly believe as people. Uh, but fortunately, we're in the right system. And that's not, we can't say that for most countries. And so, you know, we could, you know, there's going to be positives. For, if Trump wins, there'll be positives if, if Biden wins. But, you know, my opinion is kind of in spite of who wins, you know, we, we do have an econ economy and a system that, that will function fine. And uh, so that I just, I wouldn't be making, I, I think you guys have seen my slide that I have is, you know, hating a, a political party or, or hating your opponent. Is, is not a way to make an investment decision. So you don't want to make your investment decision by who's going to be in office because that's a, we, we change over hands. We don't have dictatorships. Those things change. They're very dynamic about our system. So sorry, you can't pinpoint me to a, uh, a, a super direct answer on that, but hopefully that, that, that did make sense. <laughs> Bob. Uh, so then I said, do you plan to, uh, to run for political office someday? No, um, I would be happy to share ideas. Uh, but that would probably be the last thing that I would want to do. Um, but I am going to share my fun ideas on fixing social security and the student debt issue. And so, you know, I hopefully, hopefully you see from when, when I do these, I try to take a very pragmatic approach to this and nobody has all the answers. I certainly don't, but I try to take all this information and, and, and make it actionable so that we can make better decisions. And a lot of it is just having confidence. You know, you all as individuals want to have confidence that your future is going to be better than today and that your financial situation is going to be healthy. And that's what we're trying to spend time on is having confidence and that, you know what, we can move forward, we can make decisions. And I'm really confident that coming out of all of this, we're heading in the right direction. We're going to be able to look back and say, we should have done this a little bit differently. We should have done that a little bit differently, but we can't live our lives always looking in the rearview mirror and trying to second guess decisions. You have to make a decision. You got to move forward. And if you make a decision, that's not great. You got to pivot. You got to make a change. And I think that's what we're going to be able to do. And so you can all tell from, from my, these that I've done, I'm very optimistic about where we're heading where we're heading as a nation, because I think there's so much innovation in the pipeline. And so, um, we're up on time. You guys have been great. Thanks for your questions and uh, stay tuned for two weeks from now. Uh, we're going to do the, uh, uh, the update on inflation, taxes, and the national debt, uh, which 
is a definitely a, a hotly debated item. So I'll try to give you my insights and bring you lots of fun uh, graphs and charts. Thank you guys. Have a great night.